So that defaulted to a cowboy hat. Because <laughs> I already have notches on my ear and my nose and places. And I sure want to keep those. So that should say power on. My goodness gracious, look at that. This is like the safety on a shotgun. You do that? You don't do that. You can red your dead all day long. It won't work. But now it's red your dead. Okay, let's let it power up here. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Reverend John Mayen. I minister with Grace Community International. Eleanor and I have been married for uh, 48 years, coming up 49. We have four children, four grandchildren. We've had the privilege of ministering and traveling in 29 countries, uh, teaching uh, Bible conferences and uh, also taught in the Reformed Seminary of St. Petersburg, Russia, as the visiting professor of pastoral theology and the Baptist Seminary of Minsk, uh, Belarus, under the same title. Had the pri privilege of ministering uh, with the Navigators for 20 years. In the next 10 years, I ministered as an education pastor in the area of discipleship and witnessing. We had a program, a training program, on loan from the Navigators. And uh, then in the year 2000, when my children were all grown and uh, walking with the Lord, we uh, We began ministering internationally, primarily in third world countries, teaching on a number of subject, subjects, but uh, this was one of them. So, uh, there is plenty of time for questions and discussion after the seminar is over. We want to um, honor the sacrifice that men have made who are here and want to get everything. So it's kind of like in my seminary class in St. Petersburg. I'll be teaching on a subject. Oh, man, people are raising their hands. Oh, oh I just got a dog. Oh, oh, please, please, best your job. Please let me say something. And so I'd say, well, okay, uh, in a minute, we're going to have a, about a 20-minute break for tea and biscuits, and you can stay around. So uh, no one stayed around. So that told me that question was somewhere between interrupting me and tea and biscuits. <laughs> tea and biscuits ran one out. So you are more than welcome to stick around here. I will sit right down there and talk with you all day if you like. I'd be more than happy. So uh, we are at the Key Men's Conference in uh, Chaparral Baptist Assembly in Wichita Falls, outside Wichita Falls. The, this is the year tw February 2024. The workshop uh, in, uh, title is Discipling Your Team. Let's go the Lord in prayer. Gentlemen, let's stand up. Go the Lord in prayer. So we'll ask God to bless his holy, eternal, and inerrant word as we give him to remove your hats as we go before God. Oh Lord God, this is your holy word. We are your servants. Give us understanding that we might know your testimonies. You have prayed, O Lord, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Use your holy, eternal, inerrant written word to set us apart this morning to your service and to your glory. Show us now great and mighty things which we do not know. The sower sows the word. Let not your word go out and return empty, but accomplish that purpose for which you have drawn us together and for which you are sending it out. Protect us from Satan who will snatch your word. Protect us from the world's cares and the delight of wealth 
and the passion of other interests which enter in and choke your word, making it fruitless. Protect us from difficulties and discouragements and persecutions which make our hearts hard and unresponsive to your word. Rather plow up now the hard ground of our hearts, O Lord. Grant grace that your sown word would send roots downward and then bear fruit upwards. Give us good soil, O Lord. Spread your word before us as a banquet table this morning. Grant grace that we might eat of the rich meat and drink of the sweet milk of the great doctrines of your holy word. Give us the heart of the prophet who cried to you, Thy words were found and I did eat them, and thy words became to me a joy because I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Unsheath now the sword of your spirit, O Lord. Cut to the dividing point of soul and spirit, bones and marrow. Judge now the thoughts and intentions of each heart gathered here, both the one who speaks and the one who hears. O oh Lord, we live in a dark and a wicked age. Broad is the way in many are on it, which leads to destruction. Make your word a lamp to our feet. Make your word a light to our path. Show us that narrow way that you would have us run. And Lord, as we run in the paths of your commandments, enlarge our hearts that in loving you, we might be more obedient to your written word. Drop your word against our lives as a plumb line, O Lord. Grant grace that we might not deviate from its high and holy purposes. Make your word to us a mirror, O Lord. Grant grace that we might not be as those who look and then go away and then promptly forget, but make us active doers, not forgetful listeners of your holy word. O Lord, because of our fealty to you, because of our undying love and devotion to your Son, our resurrected Savior, we pledge to you this day our total submission to your holy, eternal, inerrant written word. And we pledge to you our unquestioning obedience to all of its commands. In the name of our Lord and our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. May be seated, gentlemen. Why is your dog better trained than your team? Why is your bird dog better trained than your team? The phenomenon of the 21st century that many men would rather spend time with their dog than their children. Well, you spent time with the dog, you trained the dog, you continually reinforced the dog, you, your dog receives a lot of personal affection from you. You were highly committed to your dog's success so that you wouldn't be embarrassed on the field. If you did all, if you sold your dog and did all these things with your son, then your son would be as big a blessing as your bird dog. Your dog also is so excited when you come home from work, he doesn't just sit there looking at his handheld device. But that's not my seminar to you, that's Eleanor's seminar to your wives. If I walked in the door, 
from uh, church at the end of the day, and my children were not there to hug me and greet me. They each received two spanks with the wooden spoon. So, now you know. You're, you're kind of wondering about that, weren't you? I have a businessman in Bible study. He has his dog on, a, on his uh, wallpaper on his phone. You know what he told me? When I come home at the end of the day, my dog is waving at the window for me and is the only one who greets me. Well, he married wrong. You might want to talk about that with your wife. Why do you have a better relationship with your dog than your team? Well, you involve your dog in all of your activities. Why do you berate and embarrass your teens in public and expect to have a good relationship with them? That's a kind of a current trend in the 21st century. My son, uh, Captain Mayhem, will visit us at church with his wife, and I'll be standing around at the coffee bar back there. By, by the way, I brought muffins and coffee and stuff for y'all that coffee, uh, uh, feel free, this is not elementary school. You need to stand up, stretch your legs, walk back there, refill your cup, feel free to do so. Get a muffin. People say, well, I bet you had your hands full raising him. Can't you see that being said? I look at him right in the face and I say, well, actually, that's not true. I could not be more proud than my son. He's never embarrassed me. In fact, he's my hero. Then I just look at him in the eye. Daughter gets her driver's license. Well, I guess you better warn us before he, whenever she gets on the road. Actually, that's not true. My daughter's very responsible. I love her. Of course, I do pray for her safety because of other crazy people. I need never lose a wink of sleep because of my daughter's behavior. Then I look her right in the eye. Why do you join in and berating your teens along with your friends? and then expect them to have a, have a close relationship with them? Why don't you defend them? My wife defends me. We were coming home from church and I was getting a little distracted. Uh, we were heading over to a restaurant in Stillwater called the Steer Inn. And I was talking with Eleanor was there. There was a couple from church in the back seat. I kind of got my head turned around. I drifted off to meet the uh, the divider there, oh, and the car honked at me. Is it that? My wife uh, leaned out the window and said, You jerk! Don't you honk at my husband! So, my wife doesn't join in with my enemies like Abigail did, berating me in public. No, I married a Ruth, a Sarah, a Esther. So you can talk with your wife about that if you need to. If you're in a full-time ministry, if you're in the military, if you're an airline pilot or in sales that takes you away from home, your teens are not bitter at you because you travel. Your teens are bitter because when you can come home, you don't. When, uh, at, when we had children, I put my shotgun up, I put my rod and reel up, I put my running shoes up, I put my tennis racket up. I ceased to have hobbies. I had children. Sam liked to fish, I fish. Rebecca liked to walk in malls, I walked in malls. Lizzie and Megan liked the park especially flower parks. I like flower parks. Sam played baseball. I was a baseball dad. Liz was in the band. I was a band dad. Rebecca ran track. I was a track dad. Megan was in the arts, speech, art contests, sculpture contests. That's the kind of dad I was. Then my life, my last child left home, and then I could have hobbies again. 
So men, hobbies and personal time are a luxury you cannot afford when you have teenagers. They are your ministry. People ask me, John, well, how did you balance ministry and family? I said, that's a nonsensical question. That's how, like, how do you balance ministry and prayer? How do you balance ministry and will? My family is my ministry. Now, I have other ministries also. But they are my ministry. My son asked me, um, Dad, uh, now I'm grown, I'm in a men's Bible study and around other men who have children, I've, I've noticed, uh, you know, my life when I was growing up, you and my dad is really different. I said, well, Sam, it was uh, three things, and I give all the credit to all these three, three things from the Lord. First, your mom and I didn't grow up in Christian homes, so we developed a notebook. And anytime we saw someone who had well-behaved children, I mean well-behaved children, we would sit down with them. And we had our notebook open. We'd ask them questions like, how do you keep your, how do you get your children to eat so politely at the dinner time? They sit there with the tray and the, and the Cheerios and stuff are on the tray. They don't make a mess. They're not disruptive. And they would say, well, you got to love them. Love them into the kingdom. got to love them. Well, we noticed that even, even pagans love their children. <laughs> so I said, no, give us something practical. Pray. Pray them in. And they'd, well, we notice people with sullen, rebellious, obnoxious children seem to have all the prayer requests in the home, small group, don't they? So they no, give us something practical. And they'd say, oh, yeah. I, well, this is what, and they would tell us exactly what they did, and we would write it down and do it. And then we had children that we could take to Chinese restaurants. Because that's the ultimate test, isn't it? Not McDonald's. Where they have a clear plexiglass shield that separates you from your children. And they can act out their violence and throw themselves in urine soaked balls and scream and shout while, while you carry on a normal conversation. McDonald's created that not because they like your children, but because they know how ill-mannered and disrespectful of property your children are, and they still want you to come to their restaurant. It's kind of like, why do churches have children's church? In my age, there was no children's church. Children's church is not because the church has a uh, heart desire to minister to your children on their level. There's children's church because your children will not sit still, listen, participate, take notes, and not be a disruption. So let's get them out of there. My children were in the nursery, but they were never in children's church. My teens never sat down with the teens passing notes and snickering. They sat with us or if I was on the preaching rotation with the elder. You have the right to ask two questions. You do. You have the right to ask two questions, and anybody who um, teaches on marriage, on family, you have the right to ask them these questions also. By what authority is this guy teaching these things? And what does this person's marriage and family look like? So we are going to base the things we're talking about in just a minute on God's holy, eternal, inerrant, written word, which transcends both time and culture. I've been married 48 years. So this is guys, right? What's, you know, a good uh, at a women's conference. I've been married 48 years. Uh, Friday night is still date night. John still brought me roses and candy for Valentine's Day, and we had reservations out. We still eat sit-down dinners together. He holds my hand when we pray, 
and we talk and talk and talk, and then we just talk and talk, and then we uh, fall asleep together in each other's arms, and he prays his a prayer of thanksgiving, and oh, it's, uh, we still have a wonderful life together, get up in the morning, have our quiet time. It's just delightful. So, that's it. This is me. I'm having the best sex I've probably had in 48 years. So, all right. I didn't have bad sex before, but it keeps getting better. So, you guys relate to that, don't you? So I must have a good marriage, right? Yeah. So, it's this one. Two fun nights, one honeymoon night every week. So, at my age, I'm still, I'm still doing pretty good. Pull that off. Okay. Why is our life so different? I work two jobs, always. I would go to work in the morning, heading over to the church office or the campus. I had an index card on the dashboard in those days. And I had what I had to get done that day. Meet with the secretaries, make sure the brochures in order, got to take off, meet with the groundsman, make sure Things are the building time, make sure the men's restroom is working in order. There were some complaints about that. Uh, check my appointments with my deacons and my Sunday school leaders, make sure those were set up, you know, staff meeting, blah, 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 blah. Then at night, I would leave home sometime between five and six. I had another index card out. Sam was talking back to his mom, I need to get on top of that. The owner said, well, as he's reading, is falling behind, I need to get on top of that. Notice the beds weren't being made nicely, I need to go walk through the kids on that again. And then I went, blah, blah, blah. And then I come back and do my next job. And at around 8.39, I would clock off that job, and then I was free till 5.30 in the morning. I work two jobs. Any endeavor which is worthwhile requires three things. Hard work, long-term planning, and incremental evaluation and adjustment. Isn't that correct? So, does that typify your relationship with your team? Hard work, long-term planting, and incremental adjustments. Now, guys, I realize in the home and family, some of you are starting late. We all have to be like Paul. Paul was sitting there. He's about to preach, let's say, in uh, Ephesus. Or maybe in Jerusalem, Antioch. There is a widow, why is she a widow? Paul had her husband executed. There's some children living with their auntie. Why are they living with their auntie? Paul sold their parents onto Roman slave ships. There's a man in the back, he can't sit down. The reason he can't sit down for long periods is Paul had him beat so many times, he's a, he's a cripple. I'm sure the Bible doesn't say this, but can't you hear Paul reflecting as he was about to get up there? Lord, why didn't you save me early? James and John wanted to call down fire in the whole city, and you stopped them. Peter cut off the centurion's ear, and you healed him. Why, why, why didn't you stop me early? Why so, I, I mean, made all these terrible mistakes. Now I've got to preach to these people? But the Paul, my grace is a it's sufficient for you. Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. So that's what we need to do, man. This is where we're gonna start. We're gonna start being good, responsible, Obedient dads. See, I grew up in an age when fatherhood meant shelter, a good place to live, food, good meals, 
pantry always full. Clothing, didn't go to church, school or church looking raggedy. Education, and church on Sunday. Gentlemen, any Baptist orphanage can supply that. A room, clothing, meal, education, Sunday chapel. Any Baptist orphanage can supply that. The variable, gentlemen, is disciplining and training the child for success. Those things are just break even. If that's what you've been doing, you haven't been doing anything more than any state institution will do. Let's look at a passage of Holy Scripture, shall we? Let's turn to Hebrews 11, uh, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But with you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Now the word, the Greek word there is discipline, not punishment. The Bible recognizes uh, a difference between those things. When I'm uh, ministering in Russia, it's a tough road because Russia does not have a word in its language for discipline, only punishment. But discipline is proactive. We're going to look at that. It looks to the future. But it presupposes that the father is in the home carrying this out. So, are you there? Well, it's Saturday morning, great day for fishing. Kids don't have anything at school, let's get out there and go fishing. No. What do your teens like to do? You're going to do it with them. If they don't like doing it with you, how do you become good friends with a person? You do things with them. If you are navigator trained, you should be the best father of a teen than anybody else. Unfortunately, many navigator trained men are more obsessed with training other people's children than their own. So it's, it's not that you don't train other people's children, it's your children are a slice of the pie. So it's a matter of dividing up your time in terms of responsibilities. Verse 10, well, verse 9. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? And all of my children have said, you know, Dad, it, it's, uh, when a pastor preaches on the discipline of God in terms of training us in hard times and things like that, it really has helped us that your discipline was done out of love for our success. All of my children uh, in the adult years have said at one time or another, I'll paraphrase it, Dad, you weren't perfect, you didn't do everything right. In fact, we would not even expect that. But we never doubted two things. You loved us, and you were making the decisions for our success. Ten, for they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. That's, that's what God demands of us. You have four or five years, and you, God expects you to give it your best shot. Then you're done. You're not responsible for your adult children. But during that four or five years, he expects you to give it your best shot. Can you honestly say that you work two jobs and you don't have time for anything else? Because those two jobs are all consumed. 
To be a father is to assume a high and holy title, which is accompanied by responsibilities that we share in the name of God. Notice that in uh, verse 10 continues, he disciplines us so our, for our good so that we may share in his holiness. And gentlemen, that's what we do for our children. We discipline them for our good. We are concerned with our teenager's success. So you have two lists. What activities are, is my teen involved in that is leading to success? You reward it. What actions or activities are, is my teen involved in that is not leading to success? You discipline and change it. That's your job description. And that's a full-time job. What is the goal? The goal is our children's success. We're on verse, uh, page 10. That our children would grow up to live fruitful and fulfilled lives apart from the parents. That's what we want, isn't it? Not some guy, you come home from work, <clears throat> you, you, you see him flapping the door trying to get the smoke out. Coke can on the floor, he's been lying there eating your food, watching TV. That's not the goal, is it? We want them to live apart from our parents while at the same time having a loving relationship with our parents. All of our adult children have bought homes with a room for Eleanor and I. And every holiday, every vacation day I have, they are in hotly devoted negotiations for who gets mom and dad. Because we have a great relationship with them. Why did the football coach make you run till you threw up? So you could win district, not because he hates you. Why did the violin teacher make my daughter practice until her fingers hurt and she cried? So she could stand up there in the school auditorium and get the certificate and have the music teacher or the principal bring her up the roses and recognize her. Not because she hated children in their life. It's discipline, it hurts, but it's for their good. Any discipline of your children that is reactive is punishment and is sin on your part. If they have done something wrong and you are disciplining them, you are disciplining them with the future in mind so that they can succeed. Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother with the first, which is the first commandment with the promise. For children to live in a right relationship with God, they have to obey and honor you. God has taken authority away from you. It's not an option. Ensuring your children are in a right relationship with God is not sending them to youth camp or the youth mission trip. It's being there day after day after day with honoring, obedient children who are being prepared to go away to college and walk with Lord. So I said you had two questions that, every, that you should ask of any book you read. The first is, what's it based on? We'll be looking at Holy Scripture and things that worked for Eleanor and I. The other thing you, could, you should be able to ask is, what does your marriage look like? Well, I've told you what my marriage looks like. My children, when uh, they were in preschool, sat at the table. We had evening meals together, <clears throat> Sunday meals together. We could go to a Chinese restaurant when they were in a high chair. That's the ultimate goal, remember? 
who left and there, there was no one ever swept up after my child. I was already was raising a dog. I was over at a guy's house and he fed his, he had a laboratory, he fed his laboratory and he put a newspaper out and there was the food and there was the water. There's food and water everywhere and then he cleaned up that drink. And then he had his daughter and he, there was a high chair and there was a chair he was on there and there's newspaper and stuff and some water. We he cleaned up after her. I didn't, I was raising a Labrador. It would never happen in my home. When they entered, they would come. They would go to sleep at night without giving my mom, without giving my wife a headache. They would hush when told to hush. They were sweet, obedient children. When they got into school, each was in the head of their class every year. Trivia question. Okay. I had four children. One was good at reading. Not I. An individual. Hezekiah. Hezekiah has four kids. One is good at reading, always above grade level. One is not. One is good at math, always above grade level. One is not. One is active socially, has friends, is one, the other spends all their time in their room. One is, uh, I mean, they're not necessarily chosen first at church events and th things like that, but, but they are a competent at the uh, volleyball, softball, swimming, things like that, and never embarrass themselves. The other is always embarrassing themselves, always chosen last. So Hezekiah has four kids, same school, same parents, same church, same teachers, same small town, everything's the same. Yet those children are very, very different. Why? What would you say? Why? Because God made them all individuals. They're all unique. Yeah. Well, okay. Why? Yeah, we can blame God. Good. Let's blame God. Okay. Why? Well, uh, they have different gifts, right? Different abilities, right? Now you are a great candidate for the secular humanist school of parenting. So let's blame evolution. You know the real reason? The father. See, it is true we have different gifts, but that just means it's more work for some children than others. All of my children were at the top of their grade level in reading. One child would just come home and start reading. The other child, so the other children had to read out loud to me every day. Learn to read their Bible in a book, not using their finger, reading out loud to me every day. They were at the top of their reading group also, and I had the headache. One child was naturally gifted in mathematics. The other, when they were little, I would sit there with the flashcards and Finally, they would be crying, they would take a break, but same with the violin, right? Same with throwing up on the football field, right? Then we would start again. All my children were at the top of their class in mathematics. They were at the top of the class, I had a headache. All of my children, none of my children were, were chosen last. Now my son was a gifted athlete, he played 5A baseball. Great, I knew, you know, we just played with him. But with my other children, we practiced throwing, we practiced kicking, I made sure they could swim, we practiced volleyball. None of them were chosen last. They weren't embarrassed at social outings, and I had no Saturdays. All of my children could handle themselves socially. Two of them were social butterflies, two of them were introverts, but none of them got to just sit down in the car and pull out their handheld device or go up in their room and, and shut the door. No, they all had to interact, interact socially. They could all interact socially. I had all, I was there always for a sit down dinner because that's one of the places they were at. I was around in the evening. No TV, no devices after school. What did they do? They do their homework and then they inter interact with each other and play games and talk with dad and take walks and play with, play with the dog and help mom and 
learn to function socially? So the answer to that question is the father. If your child is not doing well in mathematics, you take a hard look in the mirror. If your child is embarrassing themselves when they read, you take a hard look in the mirror. If your child has poor social skills, you take a hard look in the mirror. If your child doesn't like to go to church camp or do things with the youth because they're embarrassed themselves at softball or volleyball or swimming or whatever it is, you take a hard look in the mirror. That's, that's on you, Dad. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. That's the goal, isn't it? Your child's success. Spiritual, mental, physical, emotional. Your child's success. They're not plants. You don't just sit them there and say, I hope it works out. It's your child's success is your goal. Well, who has a college degree here? Richard, Richard Smith, what's your degree in? Give me uh, four, there's a young man here, he's in high school, he's thinking about uh, majoring in electrical engineering. What are, you, what are you suggesting for things? That, young age. that when he goes away to school, what are four things to do that he would end up with that degree? What would you suggest? Um, be teachable. Okay, teachable, good. And study. Study, and study okay. And uh, do what the professor, do the homework. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe find someone else to, who's doing that. Okay, okay, do that too. That won't work. <laughs> You know, it'll never work, it should not, sorry, not that time. Won't work, won't work though. Well. well, I see, that's ridiculous. Do you have a degree on your wall? Yes, oh, not on my wall. You have a degree? Yes. Okay. You can't take that away from Richard. You can say, I don't want to do it the way you did it. But you can't say it won't work because he's got the degree. You can say, I don't want to do this the way you're talking about, John, but you can't say it won't work. Because when my children were in high school, they were each president of the Christian Student Union. They were involved in the youth evangelism program. They were on the youth leadership council. They were on the youth praise team. They were on the youth ju just say, they manned the youth just say no table at school. I came by the see my son at lunch. I know he was manning the just say no table. I said, how's it going, Sam? Anybody come by? He said, no, they mainly just come by and curse at me. So that was my kids in high school. They each went away to college and joined a church and a campus organization to the Navigators to Campus Crusade. When they graduated, they each went on a mission trip. Uh, Sam to South Africa. Uh, Megan to East Asia, uh, Rebecca to the Middle East, and then to Mozambique later, and then uh, Liz to Zambia. They came back from their summer mission trip and each got a job, full-time career that they studied in. They married Christian spouses, each of them, and are raising their children in the Lord and in the church. So. All four, children of a full-time Christian minister. All four. So the goal is not that we have one kid who turns out. That's plants. Buy four plants from Walmart. Maybe one lives, right? You're happy, right? My children are not plants. So here's something you may face, gentlemen. The first is Eli, the distracted father. 1 Samuel 2, 12, around page 11, Eli's sons were worthless men. They didn't know the Lord. That's contrasted with Titus 1, 6, who says Christian leaders must have children who believe. 
But notice 1 Samuel 3, 1, the soft, Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. While Eli was raising up the greatest prophet to ever live until John the Baptist came along, his own sons were slipping through his fingers. Man, you may be raising up a good company. You may be raising up, you may have an excellent gear lease. You may, you may be acing everybody when you drop that bass boat in the water. You may have a great Sunday school class. You may have a great youth ministry or church ministry. But at the same time, are you letting your own children slip through your fingers? Don't do that. Well, John, who do you say that my children have to obey me? I would not say that. God the Holy Spirit says, children, obey your parents for this is right. For a child to live in a right relationship with God, when the father says come, the child must come. If the child doesn't come, the child is in a wrong relationship with God. Well, that's black and white thinking. Well, you'll have to um, take that up with God the Holy Spirit, John. Samuel was a distracted family. While Samuel was bringing a whole nation back to God, he allowed his own sons to fail. Now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He used to go annually on a circuit, and around and around and around he went. 8.3. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways. Samuel should have taken a page from the book of Moses. Raise up some men, train them in each of these cities, let them do the ministry. You stay home and behave yourself to your sons of Rob, then you'll be free. People say, John, how can you travel around the world teaching and preaching on marriage and family when you're going away from home eight months out of the year? I say, because I didn't. From the time we had a baby till she was till our youngest child was a sophomore in college, I stayed home and behaved myself. Five meals at home, one work night, one work weekend, Sunday. And I stayed home by him. So. All my life, I was told, you cannot do that, live like that, and succeed in the ministry or whatever. And here I am, and my children are all walking with God. Don't believe a lie, gentlemen. Fulfill your responsibility. Pastors come and go. Churches come and go. Ministries come and go. There's nothing wrong with them, but they do come and go. The only ministry you have that has permanent longevity is your wife and your children. Invest like that. Another reason fathers fail is hypocrisy. Because kids want to be just like that. You know, when I was in the college ministry, you know what the most difficult kid to get involved in the disciplines of discipleship was? Church kids. Because they wanted, they were in college, now they're going to be like that. Little Sam, little, little Hezekiah, he goes in and takes a drink of water from the milk jug. His mother says, what are you doing? Well, Danny does it. Well, when you're grown, you can do it too, but not now. You ask, and you drink out of the glass. Okay. Time to go to church. I want to drive. So you're not going to drive. Daddy drives. That's right. You're grown. You can drive, but not now. But, uh, football game's on. Sunday night football. Time to go to bed. Daddy's not going to bed. That's right. And when you're grown, you can stay up too, but you're not. And so Hezekiah wants to grow up just like Dad, doesn't he? Doesn't it? Drink milk out of the jug, right? Drive a car? Stay up late watching football? Throw away that Awana pack. He doesn't have to do that anymore. Not do his Bible lesson. He doesn't have to do that anymore. Miss church if he's had a, if, if he was out of town, got in late Saturday night, they don't have to go to church anymore. Read the Bible through, do his Bible reading. He doesn't have to do that anymore. Night-night prayers, he doesn't have to do that anymore. He wants to be just like Dad. 
Dad never brings anybody to church, so he doesn't have to bring people to church anymore. Just like Dad, right? Your son wants to be, grow up and be just like you. <coughs> it's important that your children memorize scripture, but it is more important that they grow up reviewing your verses. At kids' school in the morning, I pass around my verse back. That's great indoor sport, catching Dad on a word. You can even say the verse over again. It's important for your children to invite their friends to church. It's more important for your friends to see people in church that you've led to Christ and they are now members of that church. It's important for your church children to do their Sunday school Bible reading. It's more important that they see you in the evening in your favorite chair, sitting there with your decaf coffee and the lamp on and your Bible and pen out doing your evening Bible reading. It's important that your children have a daily quiet time. It's more important that they grow up having a daily quiet time with you. Right? Then they can grow up and be just like that. So I'm going to ask Richard Smith to come up here, and he's going to share some things he did for modeling with his children. My name is Rich uh, Smith, and I, uh, oh, oh, okay. Okay. I owe a really a lot, uh, of course, to God, but to the fact that I had the advantage of being in the discipleship ministry for about 10 years before I even got married and had, had children uh, in the Air Force and in college, and I knew some of these, and then uh, we had children. I was fortunate enough to have men like John come along in our church that uh, our first child was six months, and uh, talked about parenting the younger years. And so what we did is, uh, as we looked at the teens, we, we, we tried to practice what we we heard early on, and I promised Kathy that uh, if I went to the key men's every year, um, I would go to at least one workshop on either parenting or marriage of the four choices, and she said, oh, that's good. So I've got uh, all these years of taking at least one thing home So and, and trying to put it into practice. So here's a, a few things that work. So I've asked my kids, after the teen years, what did you appreciate most about it? Would you change anything? And they, they both said, uh, we have a daughter, Amanda, 38, and a son, Andrew, who's 35 next week. Uh, they said that they really wouldn't change anything. But some of the things they liked that we did was, uh, you know, they went through, we took them to church, of course, and were there with them and uh, had an evening devotional time, sometimes in the morning, but every night, and I would read the, the scripture and, and pray because they heard mom pray at lunch and morning and throughout the day. So they needed to hear me do it. So part of uh, uh, I needed to, I wanted to become um, a, a spiritual goal was to help them come to Christ, of course. But even more than that, my vision even early on, I probably got it from John Mann, John Crawford, John Recast, other and three Johns and a lot of other people. No, I want to make disciples. There, there are my closest, most important disciples. You know, because we're here finding a, find a man. And I was involved in meeting man to man uh, for a number of years before my teens came along. And I, wow, they both were Christians by the time they were teens. This, this is perfect. Why don't I ask them if they'd like to do lessons on assurance? It's the first beginning. What's what I would do with any new or young Christian that hadn't been through it? And they both wanted to do it, and so we'd go to Brahms, or you know, so just slowly go through the the lessons on assurance, five five Bible studies, and then I thought, well, we go through that, and they were memorizing all five verses, and they did Iwanas at church, so, but they noticed that most of the Iwana leaders, unfortunately, are not memorizing the verses, and most of the kids quit memorizing as soon as they finish Iwanas. So uh, as John was just saying, I didn't plan, he didn't plan on this, and I didn't either, but. I, we would get together just one-on-one. -on -one. My daughter, we, she loved daddy-daughter dates, and I loved spending time with Andrew. Um, and I'd have them, you know, here, here's my verse pack. Would you help me review this, or here's my, my new verse? And uh, so we did Bible study together. We did, I did Second Timothy with both of them. I did a book on purity with my teenage son that Josh McDowell did, and another book related to that once I realized that uh, we had our computer that they use for school and anyway we kind of learned to figure out uh, what they're watching so we had to have talks about about that and give them the reason why and control media even at that as 
long ago is that? And you know how long ago that was? It's worse now. So the, there was a spiritual goal. I wanted them to, to be, be a disciple. By the time they went off to college, they would be ready to hit the ground running and be fruitful. And they both did. They both did well in school. They went, both went to college, got involved in Christian parachurch ministries. Uh, later, they, they're both married, stable, jobs, anyway, all that. I, the, uh, I had a relational goal was to be their friend when they became, after they became adults, that we would still be friends. So we did things like uh, game nights uh, all along, even through the teen years. Uh, I was involved in, um, Andrew loved basketball, so he was on the, the high, uh, high school basketball team. I bought a half season tickets to, uh, before the Oklahoma City Thunder, the New Orleans Hornets spent a couple of years there in Oklahoma City. So he, we had a great time just, just doing games once in a while, take, taking him, he and I. Uh, Amanda, she just wanted to go, as John said, to the mall, things like that. But she was involved in choir, so she wanted us to help her raise money for the choir trip by helping at the Indian Taco stand at the Oklahoma State Fair. So. Uh, my wife and I and Andrew pitched in, and all four of us worked enough hours. We, we don't, after two or three years of doing that for her trips, none of us eat Indian tacos anymore, but uh, <laughs> we used to like them. But she got to go on some good trips um, with that, and so just being involved in their lives, we had uh, a number of other things uh, involved in their homework. As uh, John said, I wanted to be more involved. I, I didn't have a dad who did any of these things. Uh, no, no sports, no school, uh, really nothing. So I learned from Christian men in, in the ministry that I looked up to. So I helped them in the evening with whatever uh, subject, uh, usually it was math or science. My wife did very well with, with everything else. I taught them how to drive and uh, stretched that out as long as I could. And so we had good times in the car and good, good talks about and practical things about being safe, and they're both great drivers. Uh, we, um, I grew up in North Carolina, so every year we would take a driving trip to North Carolina. It's a long two, two day at least, just driving it without a bunch of stops. If there were teens, we asked them, would they like to be involved in helping plan this trip? So we'll let you stop anywhere you want between here and there. If it were me, I would just, just go there and come back. But uh, So we let Andrew, he said, I want to stop at uh, Pick a, pick a NASCAR racetrack, Bristol, Tennessee. Well, that's a little out of the way, but I said you could pick anything you wanted, so we get out, out of the way, let him do that. Next year it was Talladega, that's a little more out of the way. Take the southern route in North Carolina, and, and so on. We learned a lot about how hard it is to find some of these tracks. They're in very tiny little place, obscure places. But uh, Amanda got to do the same thing. And so we tried to get them involved, and I just wanted, and we're still, we're both, we're close to both of them. We're still good friends, and they're both great friends of one another. And then the practical skills, so there's the spiritual, the relational, and the practical, which is teaching them things, how to, how to do, how to manage their, their money and time. So they were, they were, uh, they were just shocked when they went to college. And said, you know, we're getting our work done. Nobody else is really getting their work done. Well, we, they were taught mostly by my wife, who taught them how to sit, and study and concentrate and get and follow instructions and you'll do well if you can do some very simple things even as a teenager and so we went um, I gave my I think Andrew was about 16 or 17 I wanted to put a, a stone patio in my in the backyard for uh, under some trees where I couldn't get any grass to grow so I thought, I'm gonna buy some of these flat stones they're all different kind of odd shapes and uh, the sand and the base that goes with that I said, would you like to do this for me? And I'll pay you. And he recruited a couple of basketball buddies and, and he did a great job. He, he planned it and laid it out and uh, I was really proud of him. I think that really, he looked back on that and how important that was to give him something to build his, his confidence that you know, he can do other things. So there's, there's practical things that we tried to teach them and uh, reading good books together, or these long trips to North Carolina, we might read the screw tape letters or other books that fit into their school and provide good talk about spiritual warfare. Or we wouldn't use necessarily that term, but just what are you facing? So uh, 
just a lot of time and interest in sh showing that we, we cared about them. We, we were, um, of course, people told us when they were younger and they were obedient that just wait, just wait till the teen years, just wait. Well, we decided we weren't going to listen to them. We were just going to look forward to the teen years, and they, they were even better years than the younger years. So uh, that's the short version. Thank you, Richard. I, uh, I reject any child raising philosophy that includes the word terrible with my children or the word rebellious. I just reject that. So my children never went through the terrible twos. They never went through the rebellious teens. Your children don't have to either. I have a bite mark on my hand. That's, I have a neighbor who has a dog. Now, the reason he got a boxer is because I had a boxer. And uh, you spend time with the boxer and you train it. It's a wonderful dog. But there's nothing more irritating than a big dog that doesn't obey. And this guy spends all his time yelling at his dog. His dog is barking. Bog, his dog didn't bite, but he still gnaws. Never taught him not to gnaw, not to slobber, and not to jump up on people. So why, why, does, why does he like my boxer and not like his? Well, Long-term goal. Hard work, incremental evaluations. So it doesn't take long to, ch to train a boxer puppy or, or a Brittany Spaniel. I had a Brittany Spaniel. My neighbor had, uh, other neighbor had a pointer, a really expensive pointer. I had a rescue Brittany. He was always trying to trade his pointer with me for his rescue Brittany. But he wanted things without working for it. John, your children are just a project. No, but children are a project. What do you expect if you have no projects? <laughs> so, at least take your children as seriously as you do your hunting and your fishing and your football fantasy league and your work and your ministry. At least take that. Those are all, I mean, you, you like fishing, don't you? But it's a project. Now, I take Sam pheasant hunting. We had fun. But, you, you know, get it the night before and uh, getting everything ready and getting up and getting over to Hooker, Oklahoma. And, you know, there's a whole project involved in that, right? You just all, all, all of a sudden are walking in a soy field with a bird dog running back and forth in front of you. Gentlemen, I know you're all dressed casually, okay? I have no problem with that. Turn to page 14. You want the respect of your children, your teens? Don't go to church like your mommy dressed you, okay? I'll go to church. I'm speaking in a church. I'll be dressed like this. Coat, tie, sports coat. I'm a serious man. I'm about a serious business. It's the blood of Christ, the eternal destiny of men's souls, raging up future generations. That's a serious job. It's a serious business. Most weathermen go to present the weather dressed better than you do. Why is that? Well, I know you're trying to relate to pagans. No, that's not why it is. The, the reason is, there's two reasons. One, you gain some weight, and it's hard to admit it. But, you, you know, you buy clothes that are, that are 20 pounds larger than the ones you're in college. You can buy church clothes that way, too. But the other reason is because the growing feminine influence on the church, and you get to go to church like your mommy dressed you. I'll go to church, and there'll be your wife. She'll be in nice slacks or dress. She'll have jewelry, her hair will be done, earrings, makeup, probably nail polish, perfume. She'll really look nice, won't she? Isn't that right? And there be, there's your son. He, 
you know, he's got a shirt tail out and he's probably got tennis shoes on or blue jeans and maybe a t-shirt, but he's going to the yuck yuck kids time, right? He's not really coming to church. And then there's you looking like your mommy dressed you. Why do you do that, man? Look like the spiritual leader of the woman you're with. Okay? So there's your little chart on verse on number 14, on page 14. You're looking down there, you're receiving a professional award in front of everybody in the division. It's in a formal dining facility at a five-star hotel with a big banquet and you know it's a big you know, da, 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 da. and now we're going to give the salesmanship award to, to Hezekiah and here comes Hezekiah. Tennis shoes, no socks, blue jeans, t-shirt. Oh thank you. I'm sorry. Really? No it's not, it wouldn't be that way, would it? And yet you come with your Bible in hand as a spiritual leader of your family, looking like you'd rather be fishing, which you might rather be. I was speaking in a church, and when I came through, it had the usual geriatric crowd standing out in front, you know, being the doorkeepers. And one of the guys looked at me and said, man, you look like you're going to a wedding. And I said, and you look like you're going fishing. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm ready for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and we all know where you'd rather be. Where would you rather be? Come on, guys, be men, okay? Get up, get dressed, put on a pair of shoes, Clean slacks, sports coat, shirt, tuck it in, stand tall, be the spiritual leader. Look at chapter, page 13. Don't go to church looking like your mommy dressed you, okay? Because you do. You do look like mommy dressed you. Now, when I was growing up, uh, Gomer Pyle on the Andy Griffith show. Oh, he showed you. I know it's your dad. And, you know, and, and, and Green Acres and the overalls and, you know, and, uh, you know, Beverly Hillbillies. Golly, you know. But we're going to go swimming in the cement pond. But we all know that was a joke. And we didn't go to church dressed like. And I know Duck Dynasty, those guys are fine Christian men, but it's a joke. They shouldn't be your role model for going to church. It's staged, okay? They're multi-millionaires. I've seen them when they get their awards at the TV awards show in their tuxedos. That's dumb. <laughs> Have a little respect, guys. Have a little boundaries in your life. Joseph before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh sent, called Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out to the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his clothes and came to Pharaoh. David dressed to bring in the ark. Now David was clothed with a robe and fine linen and all the Levites who were carrying the ark. Salvation and the wedding clothes. Jesus says, so what are you doing here? I've come to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Hey, you're not in your wedding clothes. I'm not going to let you in the house. That was culturally relevant. Now, he's talking about being clothed in Christ, but everybody there knew he was talking about some yokel who was going to show up to one of the most important events in this man's life, dressed in blue jeans and T-shirts. And it wasn't going to fly. You take your wife out in a clean car? Is your bed made? 
Does your wife have to get out of the car and unload the groceries in the wind and the rain and the snow because your garage is full of used junk? Come on, guys, get it together. Let's be men. Yeah, we're about to run out of time, but I'd like to close with a verse. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. I hate to set people up on this, but uh, who has the NIV Bible? Anybody? Okay, read it in the NIV first. And then, Brother John, what translation do you have? NESB. Okay, so if you have a New American Standard and ESV or a King, New King James, it would be different. So read it in the NIV, please. You said 1 Corinthians 16. 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. The Bible doesn't say that. The NIV has been neutered. It is not gender neutral because Proverbs 31, 28, which says uh, her children rise up and bless her, her husband to and praises her, doesn't say her children, the children rise up and bless them and they praise them. But it leaves it feminine, doesn't it? John, read it in. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Androzomai is a specific Greek word. It means men. It means men. It is harmful for your wife to memorize a verse made for men, just as it would be for you to memorize verses in Titus and in Proverbs meant for women. Men, <clears throat> be alert. Stand for the guys act like a man, okay? Not like a boy. Don't go to church looking like your mommy dressed you. And take on responsibilities. Playtime after school is over. You come home from work for your second job. Now, at the back of this worksheet, if you will take a look at that, are starting with page uh, 27. Quiet times alone with the Father. Here are some quiet times for you then to reflect on what we've talked about. Then on page 33, I mean on page uh, 34, you see on page 35, how to have a daily quiet time with your team are some very practical applications. I like know, K-N-O-W-B, and do. On the mission field, we have the KISS principle. Keep it spiritually simple. Most of the uh, churches I minister at, if they have a broken pencil and a scrap of paper, they're happy. Maybe a New Testament, maybe a Bible. So we keep we boil things down to, for discipleship where all they need is that scrap of paper, their pencil, and their Bible. Keep it spiritually simple. So no be do is what I teach them. Then there, then I have also though on page 37 and 38 some other types of studies you can do with your children, your teenagers. Uh, what time do you have to be, Richard, when you went to work, what time did you have to get me over there at the OG&E office? Eight, you eight. Eight. eight, okay. So, what time would Richard have to wake up? 5.30. How long is he drive over there? 30 minutes. Nice, get up 4, 30, 4 30, 5, 5.30. Because he has to get up, get dressed, get his kids up, and have the quiet time with them, have breakfast with them, and then he takes off. Look at page 39. Now, the death penalty in the law has been fulfilled in the body of Christ. We no longer send Levitical priests out to execute people. 
okay? But on page 39, you get a feeling for what God thinks about disobedient children. The fact that they go to church every Sunday doesn't change it. You know, when we're involved in the college ministry at University of Texas and Texas A&M and then at Oklahoma State University, when Eleanor met with the team leader girls, you want to know the first thing she weeded out? These are good church girls. Okay? Who's sleeping with who? Then she took care of that, then we could get on with the discipleship project. She asked that first, I asked the guys the first thing. Who are you sleeping with? Okay, we break up with her. Who are you sleeping with? Well, you have to break up with me. You're going to be in the disciple-making ministry. Good church kids don't cut it unless they are good church kids. So that's what God thinks about disobedient children. On page 41 <clears throat> is the key to the media trivia questions that were at the beginning of the sheet. Now I'd like to show you something else because Father's Day is coming up. Well, Father's Day is here once again. We know there are no good fathers in the Bible, man. And we're all failures just like they are. But take heart. God can use us anyways. Well, the Japanese have a word for that. Hagawashi. <laughs> On page 23, you have 26 exemplary monogamous fathers in the Bible. There are plenty of good fathers in the Bible. The reason you hear that is because Christian leaders want an out. God used David. David committed adultery. Ah, there's the out. So is that what your testimony, you want your testimony to be? I was a crummy father and God used me anyway. Well, John, I don't know what the deal is with you. I really don't. My grandfather, he's hardworking. He didn't do all this mushy, gushy stuff with his wife or his kids. He just, he just got on with it. And my dad wasn't close to him. And my dad, he didn't do all this stuff. I don't, I don't think my dad's my best friend. And by God's grace, I won't be friends with my kids. I don't have bad memories. Is that what you want? Come on, guys. Be alert. Okay? Look around. What's going on? What's your teenager dress like? Where are they going? Where are you going? Mall? No. Or where are you going? Out? No, you're not going out. Who are you going with friends? No, you're not going with friends. Stand right there. First place, you're not going out just like that. You can mow the lawn just like that. You can play baseball just like that. You can go to the pool, but you're not going downtown just like that. No. Okay. Another thing. Who are you going with? Leroy? Uh -huh. No, you're not going anywhere with Leroy. Where are you going to the mall? No, and you're not going to the mall. But I'm glad you have plenty of time because I need someone to be with me this afternoon. <laughs> we're going downtown. We're going to run some errands. We're going to have a good time together. I'm going to get dressed. Be on the alert, guys. And be men. Nobody, nobody, nobody treats us like, nobody raises us like you do. Good. Great kids, thank you. I'm on the right track. I thought if you were being raised like all your all those sullen, rebellious kids in that high school, I'd be heartbroken. I'm so thankful to know that. My kids can repeat that back to you, by the way. Or this. You don't understand. No, I do understand. If I didn't understand, you would be going to that party. But I do understand, and you're not going. But we will do some fun things. 
So don't just be the dad. There's a Whataburger commercial, and it shows this guy, and he's hustling out a Whataburger. And he's obviously dressed for work, and he, he's got a big thing of coffee and a, a big bag. And it says, don't be the guy who came late to the meeting. Be the guy who brought the coffee and the breakfast tacos. Okay? Don't be the dad who just says no. Be the guy, dad, who replaces the no with something fun, but with the family. My neighbor was a Pentecostal minister. His kids could not do mixed swimming. He built a swimming pool that all his son's friends, he had two boys, wanted to come over and swim at because it was such a quality deal. So he didn't just say no, he said yes. So, but that takes hard work and planning, doesn't it? Well, I commend you to God and the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those who are sanctified. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray that you would bless the teaching of your holy word and that you would bless the creative thinking of these dads in discipling their teens. In Christ's name we pray now.